joining us. We are going to uh, be hearing from Danielle Olive, who is a Jeffrey Matheny Scholar for the Friends of Virgin Islands National Park. Um, she's in her graduate studies at UVI doing some really interesting research on protected fisheries and their impacts on the health of um, our fish population. And particularly um, proud of her for her recent job at DPNR. So she was going to share with us some of her research um, and the really hands-on um, and practical application of conservation work that she's doing. Um, so without further ado, Danielle, I'm going to pass it over and I'll let you um, share your screen. I see we have one more visitor coming on board here. Uh, during the presentation, you can keep your mic muted um, and your video off if you choose. We'd love to see your face. Um, and then after the presentation, about 30 minutes or so in, there'll be a chance for you to ask questions. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Um, Danielle, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to mute myself and make it so that you can share your screen here. Yes, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. And I am getting ready to share my screen as soon as I can do that already. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I, um, my name is Danielle Olive. I'm a second year master's student at the University of the Virgin Islands. And I am super excited to share some of my thesis research with you today. Um, so I have been studying the implications of protected waters and doing an evaluation of life history characteristics of the mutton snapper in the US Virgin Islands under the leadership of Dr. Richard Niemann. Let's see. All right, so a little bit about me before I get started. I was born and raised here in St. Thomas, US Virgin Islands. And I've lived here all my life. So that's pretty much fostered my love for the ocean. And I earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of the Virgin Islands in 2019 as a Jeffrey Matheny Scholar. Um, and this generous scholarship has continued to fund me through my master's degree. So I'm super grateful for that. And again, I am a current second year master's student at the University of the Virgin Islands studying marine and environmental science. And I also currently serve as fisheries biologist one for the Department of Planning and Natural Resources Division of Fish and Wildlife. And both of these positions have given me a great opportunity to take a closer look at our local protected waters and our fisheries that depend on them. And so I'm excited to Bit about what life history characteristics are and how we study them and take a closer look at mutton snapper in the U.S. Virgin Islands, including their current status and current management practices, so we can understand what we know so far. And this will segue into my thesis project, more specifically my questions, methodology, and then my preliminary findings thus far. So Caribbean fisheries are valuable resources, especially here within the Virgin Islands, and our fisheries are small in scale. And we have both commercial and recreational sectors that rely on fisheries resources, but they also hold cultural value for our way of life. And so our local fisheries primarily target reef fish species, but also can target pelagic fish, conch, whelk, and spiny lobster. And fishing gear primarily consists of traps, hook and line nets, and spear guns. Over time, this um, economic and cultural value of our fisheries have brought about the idea of ecosystem-based fisheries management. And this is a pretty fancy term to describe a shift in ideas from maximizing fisheries catch to ensuring their long-term sustainability. So this means that fisheries managers, instead of are trying to, um, you know, trying to catch as many fish as possible in a short amount of time, are more focused on making sure that our fisheries 
withstand the test of time and are healthy for the future. And so this management has brought about the practices of designated marine protected areas and marine reserves. So a lot of these are outlined by these purple lines in this image. They have also included the closures of spawning aggregation areas, fisheries gear restrictions, seasonal area closures, seasonal market closures, and size restrictions for certain species. And all of these measures encompass spatial and temporal actions. These fisheries management practices are overseen on the federal level by NOAA, on the territorial level by the Department of Planning and Natural Resources, and then also overall by the Caribbean Fisheries Management Council. And my research project specifically focused on the practice of closing spawning aggregation areas. So that will be my main focus moving forward for this presentation. So if you're wondering what spawning aggregation sites are, spawning is the process by which fish reproduce. And so fish will come together in these really large groups at certain areas in the ocean, and they will expel their gametes into the water to be externally fertilized. And then those larval fish will be carried by ocean currents um, to places where they will settle and then begin to grow. And so spawning aggregations are areas where up to thousands of individuals come together to reproduce. And this can happen for up to several months at a time during spawning events. And so the, this you know, form, formation of spawning aggregations really are super vulnerable to fishing. Um, because if you think about it, you have areas where thousands of the oldest and most reproductive fish are gathering at one predictable area in the ocean, which makes it really easy for fishermen and others to exploit these populations. And historically, this has happened, um, if you're familiar at all with the endangered Nassau grouper, um, fishermen found their spawning aggregation areas and exploited the population until it crashed. And so there were less than 100 individuals of Nassau grouper left. And so it's been taking a long time for them to recover now that their spawning aggregation sites are closed. And so the spawning aggregation areas and times are really critical to the life history of these fish and why they are so important to be protected by ecosystem-based fisheries management. For deep reef fish species, spawning usually occurs over mesophotic reefs. And mesophotic reefs are extremely deep coral habitats. So they're hundreds of feet below the surface and they serve as highly productive habitats for fish and other marine life. Um, and because of this high productivity, this is why they're believed to be suitable for spawning. So these fish can gather at these super dense coral areas that are full of food. So they're able to stay there for months at a time and reproduce in areas that are generally well protected. Um, spawning areas for deep reef sp species for us locally typically occur along the shelf edges. So these images here show um, some of the footage that we've gotten to take of mutton snapper spawning aggregations. So the top images show small aggregations themselves. Um, and you can see that milky white um, in the water. So they just reproduced. And then the bottom images show the mutton snapper more along that bottom mesophotic reef habitat. And all of these images were taken at Tampa Bank off of St. John. So, um, Again, one such species that forms the spawning aggregations are the mutton snapper, and this is the focus species from my study. And it is characterized primarily by this black dot on its back, as well as pink fins. Um, and as an economically valuable species, the mutton snapper has many management practices currently in place. And so temporal measures include annual catch limits, as well as a seasonal market closure from April 1st to June 30th, 
So this corresponds with their spawning time. And the market closure means that fishermen cannot harvest or sell during that period of time. Spatial measures include the mutton snapper spawning closed area on St. Croix, which is closed seasonally from March 1st to June 30th. So again, primarily around their spawning time. And this was enacted in 1993, and this closure happens every year, as well as the Germanic Bank off of St. Thomas, which is seasonally closed from February 1st to April 30th of every year. And the seasonal closure for Grammatic Bank was not established primarily for mutton snapper. It actually was for spawning aggregations, primarily of other grouper species like the Nassau grouper. But because the more of the ending time of that closure time frame corresponds somewhat with the spawning time of mutton snapper, we do believe that mutton snapper might receive some residual protection from that closure period. Um, in addition, mutton snapper are known to spawn at three specific areas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So again, the Germanic Bank off of St. Thomas, that seasonally closed area primarily for groupers. Tampo Bank off of St. John, which is currently unprotected and frequently fished. And then again, the mutton snapper spawning closed area off of St. Croix. Um, and just a reminder, it's not very uncommon to see that these spawning areas are right along the shelf edge, especially for the Northern Virgin Islands, because we have such an extended area of shelf. So these are about five miles offshore. And then the mutton snapper spawning closed area on St. Croix definitely does encompass some deep reef, but because the shelf is so different on St. Croix, the habitat is a little bit different over there as well. Um, mutton snapper are also recognized to exist as two distinct stocks in the Virgin Islands. So one for the Northern US Virgin Islands and then one for St. Croix. A fish stock is defined as a subpopulation of a species that lives in the same area and interbreeds. And so fisheries managers study fish stocks by looking at three main aspects. So abundance, biology, and catch, which are the ABCs of fisheries management. And the realm of my project focuses almost primarily on the biology aspect of fish stocks. And so we study fish stock biology by looking at life history characteristics. And fish life history characteristics are attributes related to fish age, growth, mortality, maturity, and reproduction. And so these characteristics tell us how fisheries are replenished and then also lost over time. We get these characteristics by studying uh, measurements taken from fish themselves. So looking at their length and weight measurements. We also collect their gonads or reproductive organs to see their reproductive capability. So this image shows um, female reproductive organs from snapper species. And then lastly, we collect information on fish age by looking at their otoliths. And so fish otoliths are calcium carbonate ear bones that are located right near the brain cavity of fish. And so as a fish grows, calcium carbonate is deposited to these structures. And when we collect them, we can section them to create really small slices and similar to that of a tree, we can count all of these de deposits in the form of rings to get a fish age. So in this image, it's, um, this is a yellowtail snapper otolith, but you can clearly see those rings along that we can count and each ring corresponds to one year of life. So we can get an estimated age by counting these rings. The collected characteristics, so the length and weight measurements, the reproductive capability, and estimated ages can be inputted into a variety of statistical models. So for example, we can input them into size and age structure frequency tables that tell us how the population is distributed, or we can input them into linear models that tell us the relationship between two characteristics. Um, to see how fish stocks are responding to fishing pressure. 
changes in environmental conditions, and as well as make comparisons between habitat and fish stocks. And with this information, managers can decide if stocks are safe to continue fishing or not. And just a side note, um, stocks that are overfished are generally characteristics of fish that are smaller in size. So when fish stocks are exploited, fishermen tend to take the older and larger fish. So as they become more and more overfished, the mean size of these fish stocks decrease over time. So a great sign that a stock is overfished is to see that the length and weight measurements of fish are decreasing over time. So to begin my project, I had to find out what is already known in terms of life history characteristics for mutton snapper in the US Caribbean. And this is what is shown by this hefty table here. And um, so this table includes information on fish length and weight, their maximum age, characteristics relating to their growth, mortality, and then also maturity and reproduction. The TL in this table responds to, um, to total length of the fish. So that was a measurement that was taken. Fork length means, FL means fork length, which is also another measurement taken at length. The numbers after each data point correspond to the study that this was taken from. And then all of the data points in bold represent data that was taken from spawning aggregation sites only. And so what is most important to take away from this really hefty table is the overwhelming amount of information that's missing. So there's a lot that we really don't know in terms of life history characteristics of mutton snapper, especially in the US Virgin Islands. Additionally, it's important to point out that a lot of the studies that have taken place are severely outdated. So we're looking at studies that are primarily in the late 1900s or early 2000s, and so may not represent or currently represent what's going on with mutton snapper in the US Virgin Islands. Um, also, it's important to point out that a lot that we do know comes from fisheries dependent sources. And fisheries dependent sources mean that they come directly from fisheries landing, so from the fishermen. And so while this is can be super informative, um, taking information directly from fisheries dependent sources can introduce bias into our science because fishermen are you know, restricted to certain size limits, are restricted to fishing in certain areas and will fish primarily what is best for the market. And so this not always gives us a comprehensive look at the entire mutton snapper stock. Additionally, only one study has been done to date to start to compare life history characteristics between sites. And this was done by Nemeth and Kojis to compare fish found at the mutton snapper spawning coast area in St. Croix. So again, these bold numbers here versus the fish taken from Tampa Bank in St. John. And it was really interesting because they found that there was no significant difference between the two populations. And this was surprising because you would think that St. Croix, the mutton snapper spawning close area that's been closed since 1993 seasonally, should have a distinct population difference from that of St. John, the Tampa Bank, which has never been protected, but they indeed found no significant difference. However, um, when they visually looked at the data, so they made the size structure plots for the two distinct populations. So this um, graph here shows those size structures for fish from Tampo, um, shown with the blue bars, the fish from the mutton snapper spawning closed area, shown by the orange bars, with the total length of fish on the x-axis, and the percent of sample population that fit into those size classes, so how many fish that they collected fit into that size class on the y-axis. It is pretty evident to see 
that fish from the mutton snapper spawn enclosed area in St. Croix generally fit into larger size classes versus fish from Temple on St. John fit more of a smaller size classes. So there is visual evidence that there was differences between these two populations. And this preliminary data is what led to my project to see if varying management practices between these sites are what are driving these differences. So the overall purpose for my project was to address the data gaps that we've been talking about. So again, to expand the known life history characteristics of mutton snapper in the US Virgin Islands with a focus on spawning aggregation sites to determine the role that fisheries management practices may have on these characteristics, as well as to examine the relationships between fisheries data types. So I wanted to expand on, because we have a lot of fisheries dependent data, but if we overlap that with fisheries independent data, so that those that are taken more from a scientific aspect from, um, from the fish managers, we can find information that take more of a comprehensive look at our stocks because they're not regulated by fisheries practices. So these fisheries independent sources can sample the population from areas that are not targeted by fishermen. And then we can get a complete picture by overlapping the two. And this overlap hopefully can create future paths for better monitoring our fish stocks. So the study sites for my project are the three known spawning sites for mutton snapper in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So Germanic Bank off of St. Thomas, which again is protected and presumably unfished. Tampo off of St. John, which is currently unprotected and frequently fished. And then the mutton snapper spawning closed area in St. Croix, which has been protected from 1993, but we have clear evidence that it's been poached over time. And my project was split into three main research questions to attack those research gaps. So one, what are the life history characteristics of mutton snapper from spawning aggregation sites within the US Virgin Islands? And my goal to answer this question is to determine the size structure, age structure, and reproductive capability of mutton snapper at spawning sites. My second question is how do these characteristics compare between sites under varying levels of management protection? So I will be testing the statistical hypothesis that size structure, age, and reproductive capability of mutton snapper will not vary between spawning sites. However, because of their unique management practices, so again, protected areas versus unprotected, I expect that the size structure and age structure of fish at the protected areas, so the mutton snapper spawn enclosed area and Germanic bank will be greater than that uh, temple, which is unprotected. And that the reproductive capability of fish at Germanic bank, which seems to be the most protected area will be greater than the mutton snapper spawn enclosed area, but that both of these will be greater than that of temple because it's unprotected. And finally, my third question is how do these characteristics compare between fisheries dependent and fisheries independent data? And I will be testing the statistical hypothesis that there is no difference in life history characteristics between data types. And the data types that I will be examining include spawning aggregation site data. So it's an independent source of data, which is what I, I have collected throughout the summer and also from previous studies. Data from the DPNR CMAP initiative, which is pretty similar to what I have done over the summer, um, and again, is another independent source of information. The National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, Deep Coral Reef Monitoring Program, and Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program, which are nationally overseen programs that aim to assess local fish community structure at randomly stratified points. So these programs tend to just um, collect information on fish size. And so they go and they sample these random points around all three islands to get some information 
on the overall population of fish and their sizes. I will also be overlapping this with fisheries dependent sampling. So again, the information coming from our fishermen and then the NOAA trip interview program, which is another way um, that our fishermen are sampled. And I expect that life history characteristics will be greatest for spawning aggregation sites, just because um, these areas, the spawning aggregation sites are where the oldest and highly reproductive individuals gather into one area. So that introduces a sort of bias for um, the life history characteristics that we're gonna collect from that information only versus that of other fisheries independent data and fish landings, which look at more of the comprehensive. So all over the, their range, look at their stock all over their range. However, when we overlap the two, we might be able to create a ratio statistic that can tell us about the condition of the mutton snapper stocks. So um, I have collected all of my samples so far for my study. My goal beginning this project was to collect 50 fish from each site and all of my samples from the mutton snapper spawn enclosed area was collected previously um, by my advisor for other efforts. And so my field season this summer was primarily focused on getting fish from Grammatic Bank and Tampo. And so from May to September, I went out um, one week every month after the full moon. So we went out every day for one week, we set traps and we tried to catch as much fish as possible from these two sites. However, um, the currents were not as forgiving with us during the summer. So we did not collect everything that we needed. And so, especially for Germanic Bank, a lot of my samples were supplemented by those of fishermen. So I know some fishermen that have traps that are close to the Germanic Bank area. So we got fish from them and we're hoping that these, um, the fish that were in that, close to that area, still um, are representative of that spawning aggregation. Once the fish were brought on board, um, we would take measurements of length and weight. So we would take their total length, fork length, and standard length, as well as their weight measurements. And then these fish were brought back to the lab where we dove into lots of fish dissection. So fish were sexed macroscopically we extracted both of their sagittal otoliths. So again, those calcium carbonate ear bones that are gonna tell us about age and they were weighed as well as we extracted their gonads. So their reproductive organs that were also weighed. And so this image gives you an idea of our dissection fun at UVI and processing all these fish definitely took um, some time and made for some long evenings at UVI, but some of them were quite beautiful. We got to see some great sunsets. And so I just finished processing all of my fish in these past two weeks. And my otoliths were just mailed to the University of South Carolina Aiken, where they are currently being prepared. And so to prepare otoliths, they are sectioned. So again, they're sliced into these tiny little sections. They are polished and mounted onto microscope slides to look exactly like this image. And once I receive all of these slides and images, I will be able to read the otoliths using the single blind technique by at least two reviewers. So that means that myself and another reviewer will be reading the otolith, so counting every single growth ring to get an estimated age without knowing its corresponding length and weight measurements to avoid as much bias as possible. A subsample of the gonads that I collected will also be sent away to the University of South Carolina Aiken for preparation. And so again, um, a little tiny sliver of this tissue is gonna be stained and placed onto microscope slides. And with that, I will be able to determine the reproductive stage of all of my samples. I will be able to calculate the gonad somatic index, 
which is an equation that tells me how reproductive able a fish is depending on its body size. So we can get an idea of reproductive health. And then I also will be calculating fecundity. So I will be taking samples of fish eggs from these gonads, counting them under the microscope, and then relating that to the overall weight of gonads to get an idea of their total fecundity. Once all of my fish processing is complete, I will be using the taken lengths, weight, and ages to be create um, to create frequency structure plots like the one shown here. So we can see how the populations are distributed. So for example, with the length measurements, we'll be able to see how many fish from the population that I sampled fit into what size class. So we can see what the size range is and how many individuals from those sizes are within that population. And this will be done overall. So using all of my information from spawning aggregation areas, It'll be done sex specific, so male versus female fish, and then also site specific. So from the three main sites that I'm looking at to start um, seeing if there were any differences between these sites. From the reproductive analysis, I'm gonna be determining reproductive phase ratios. So for example, I'm gonna be able to see how many spawning ready individuals are present in the population versus spent individuals or those who have already reproduced, so we can get an idea again of reproductive health. With all this information, I will then be um, conducting those comparisons among sites and among the data types that I spoke about earlier. Um, and again, this will be done for all the length and weight measurements, the size structure, age structure, and reproductive potential. So, so far, I have only got to pre um, preliminary analysis using my length and weight data. And so for the first time, I'm gonna get to share that with you today. And so this graph shows the mean mutton snapper total length from 2009 to 2020, with the length of fish on the y-axis in centimeters and the area at which the fish was caught on the x-axis. And it's pretty clear to see that the length of fish from the Germanic Bank was significantly lower than that than those from Campo in the mutton snapper spawning closed area. And this was confirmed by Cruskell Wallace statistical tests that indeed showed that these measurements were different and that St. the Germanic Bank from St. Thomas fish were the ones that were significantly lower than the others. And this was extremely surprising. Um, I wasn't expecting that Germanic bank, that protected area would have the smallest fish, um, but this could be the result of one of two things. So either the fish from Germanic bank are indeed overfished and we did not have an idea of that beforehand. And that would be a really important find. Um, or uh, if you remember my samples from the Germanic bank were supplemented a lot by fishermen and so it's possible that some of these samples that I collected from them were not true representatives of the spawning aggregation sites. And so that's something that I'm gonna be looking into moving forward um, to remove some of those outliers and see if I can get a better idea of spawning aggregation sites only. The results that I got for mutton snapper weight were pretty much identical. So on the y-axis, we have weight in grams. And again, the x-axis corresponds to the area at which the fish were caught. And again, we can see that fish from the Germanic bank were significantly lower than the others. And this again was confirmed by Kruskal Wallace tests. And um, so again, this information is telling us the same thing, either the Germanic bank population is indeed overfished or there is sampling bias for the fish from Germanic bank. And that's something that I need to take into account for my analyses moving forward. Additionally, I hope to get started on my age and gonad analyses pretty soon. And then these will also help to shed some light on what these results are reflecting. 
So overall, I do believe that this and similar studies are important for understanding and monitoring our fisheries resources. In general, and unfortunately, very little is known about the performance of our marine protected areas. And with this study, I hope to shed light on how protected waters and ecosystem-based fisheries management affects the future of our fisheries and the resources they require. The ecological or biological value of our coral reef resources is just as important as our cultural use of these resources. And so as a scientist, but also the descendant of a long line of fishermen and an avid fisher myself, I do believe that there must be a balance um, within our fisheries resources to ensure their prolonged future. And so sustainable flourishing fisheries are vital to the US Virgin Islands and we must make conscious decisions to protect these resources every single day. They, there are many um, places to find more resources on proper fisheries conduct, and these include the Reef Responsible Sustainable Seafood Initiative at reefconnect.org or on their social media pages. And the Reef Responsible Initiative is something that I personally am involved in at DPNR, and so we make these recommended fish lists as well as fish calendars to help consumers and fishers have a better idea of what they you know, maybe should not remove from our ocean and what might be better choices for sustainable seafood. There's also more resources at the UVI Caribbean Fisheries Management Council, NOAA and DPNR pages. And then of course, feel, you can feel free to contact me at any time with any of my email addresses. And so these are the resources for my study and I can go ahead and take any questions. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, give folks a minute to unmute themselves if anyone had a question. I have a couple of questions myself I can think of, but we'll see if anyone can have a hand raised. See a few folks clapping. Uh, Miss Mills, very well done. Um, so I'll just ask a quick question. Um, we've talked several times and uh, you are definitely building a lot of expertise in this area. From the friend's perspective and here in Virgin Islands National Park, when we think about protected waters, um, we're often thinking about how to communicate the roles and responsibilities of the individual and how we as, um, you know, we can, we can do our part as individual visitors um, and residents here. And so I wonder in your new role at DPNR, um, how do you, how do you envision best sharing the work that you're doing with the community at large? Um, and in particular with the um, people whose livelihood depends on fishing here in the Virgin Islands? Yeah, so um, it's something that I've been talking to a lot with my director, um, but she's very interested for me to start um, perhaps giving presentations at fisheries meetings on some of the things that I'm finding both with my thesis research and with um, data that I'm working at, with, working with at DPNR. Um, another tool that I found is super helpful um, is social media. And so um, the Reef Responsible Program, as well as some other things that I've been involved at, at UVI. So we we're talking a little bit um, earlier about the stony coral tissue loss disease that I worked a lot with. Um, we got a lot of information out about those things through social media and social media campaigns. And it's something that has been especially useful carrying over into COVID times, just something that can still be done and not you know, have to worry about restrictions and regulations. Um, and so I currently am helping to run the Reef Responsible initiative social media pages. And so we're trying to get that information out there. And um, we have grown in followers in very short amount of time. So it seems like people are very interested 
to hear about these things, um, which is, you know, really great to see. And so that's pretty much my focus right now for getting information out. I definitely am an advocate. Like I love to be hands-on with things as well. So I can't wait to get back to, you know, talking with people face to face and being involved in community events because those are my absolute favorite. But until then, I think social media is a tool that should be harnessed to the best of its ability. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And um, if there's ever a silver lining, one of the positives is that we are more versed in communicating and receiving information um, and doing Zoom calls like this um, are, are something that people can join anywhere um, and the barriers that may have been there before seem to be uh, dissipating in terms of people's anxiety. At least I know I'm getting more comfortable, although we do look forward to supporting you and getting your message out in any way. Um, so Reef Responsible, if you're on social media, look for that. I see a question here. Um, and the question from Mark, who's on the call is, can you discuss some of the barriers to getting waters um, and particularly spawning sites protected? So you mentioned there wasn't a lot of information on sort of the efficacy of fisheries, yet it seems to be accepted. And we know that they do have a positive impact. So how or why don't we have more um, protected spawning sites? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, and it's something that I am especially interested in moving forward. Um, so historically, the closure of spawning aggregation sites were kind of like uh, an imposed measure. So in the early 2000s, when we saw the collapse of Red Hind Grouper and Nassau Grouper, the um, feds kind of stepped in and you know, closed these fishing areas. And there were a lot of you know, kickback from the fishermen, of course, because they were, you know, these are highly productive, we're catching so much fish. Um, and there was this big disconnect between what the fishermen wanted to do and what we needed to ensure that there were fisheries for the future and that we didn't lose these populations completely. And that disconnect, in my opinion, came a lot because there was no bridge between fishermen and scientists. And so neither side was really understanding why the decision was made and why there, were, there was kickback about it. And so I really think moving forward and you know, from my personal experience, just because I come from a family of fishermen and I'm a scientist, um, it's, I think it's most important or is, is a really useful tool to get our fishermen primarily involved in data collection. So our fishermen are the ones that are out on the water all the time. They are seeing what's going on with the ocean and they depend on the ocean. And so if we're working with them and they're seeing exactly what's going on, so they're seeing that they're not catching as much fish as they used to, or that maybe as a you know, response to these closures, they're catching more fish than they used to, they will be the pioneers for these closure areas. So with mutton snapper in particular, a lot of our um, fishermen from the St. Thomas Fishermen Association, they recognize that they, there's not that much information known. And so they want to see what's going on with these stocks they are talking to me about this project and they're interested in my results. And so I think moving forward, it's, you know, it's creating that bridge between scientists and fishermen and getting them involved in the science so that everyone can pioneer for a better future. Looks like Todd has a question. Good morning, Danielle, thank you. Um, Great presentation. I appreciate um, the the scientific rigor uh, to give a great project set up, and these things always take longer than we hope. Um, so we really look forward to, you know, kind of continuing to work with you and and learning more about your findings. Uh, the last question was just kind of a good feed, and I was curious, uh, given that um, 
we know the the marine protected area that was set up around St. John um, in 2001. Uh, you know, certainly some of those sentiments were were heard from fishermen at the time. And I was just wondering if you've heard anything anecdotally from folks about changes that they are seeing um, in this time period. Um, you kind of got into that a little bit, but I was just curious if if, if you'd had more to say about are fishermen seeing differences yet um, in your experience? Um, yes, especially um, for red hind grouper. So I know like my uncles themselves, they said, cause they lived through that time period of the closure and now they're fishing themselves. And they say that, you know, you couldn't find red hind as much as like in previous years, they were hard to find. And now they're everywhere. Like every time they pull a trap, there's red hind grouper, which is really great to hear. Um, other, um, I guess, anecdotal stories would be like when I go diving, I know when I was younger, I, I had never seen a Nassau grouper before. And every time I'm diving in the seagrass, I see at least one juvenile now. So that's, it's great to see that their numbers are coming back. Um, but I think too, from fishermen, th like understanding that our marine protected areas are working is a great story to relate to them. Because I know that at some point, you know, they, they are gonna want to, because these marine protected areas are working, they're gonna say, oh, well, maybe we can open these fisheries up in the future. And I think that, you know, that's something that could potentially happen, but it's, relaying that information that it's important to um, keep these fisheries sustainable. So if we open over time, it's not gonna be you know, a free for all like it was because we have so much more information now. We know why they collapsed and we know how to make it you know, not collapse again. And so we just have to make sure that we keep you know, adding to our information base and doing what's best for sustainable fisheries. Great, thank you. I see one more question here um, about Sigoterra in the fish. And um, I am always curious. Um, I thought that uh, was particularly in the US Virgin Islands with the shallower reefs, um, that that was a real concern. Can you share anything about that? Yes. So I personally, in my study, I'm not studying anything that like has to do with Ciguatera toxin. Um, but so one thing that I didn't mention, the protection of, or the non-protection of Tampa Bank off of St. John, um, I've been hearing a lot from fishermen that you know, although this is a spawning aggregation area, it's not protected that these aggregation areas are not collapsing because fishermen are scared to fish those big fish because Tampa Bank fish are known to have ciguatoxin. And so I've heard this from some fishermen, others are saying, you know, well, not really, as long as you don't catch the really big ones. And so there is this like socioeconomic feed into my project regarding ciguatoxin that's really interesting. Um, I haven't figured out a way to work that into my project, at least not statistically, but it's something that I do want to continue gathering information on in the future. Because I think that those connections to, you know, ciguatoxins and other diseases um, play a major role too in our fisheries management practices. And, you know, areas that may not have imposed protections might be somewhat protected because of these rumors of ciguatoxin or because of actual occurrences of ciguatoxin. And I do have a colleague in my master's class who is studying ciguatoxin for her master's project she is um, focused primarily on red hind grouper. So she's not looking at mutton snapper, um, but she is gonna be correlating ciguatoxin to depths of red hind grouper. 
to see if you know those deeper areas have higher occurrences of ciguatoxic fish. Wow, that is really fascinating. Uh, there's so many variables at play. Um, one more follow-up question from Mark it was um, with regard to climate change. So, um, you know, socioeconomic impact of human activity um, locally and then on the broader scale. So are you, how do you see climate change um, factoring into your research? Um, great question. I am thinking about that a lot. Um, so my responding aggregation areas that I'm focused on, if you remember, are primarily, you know, based on those mesophotic reefs. And because they're so deep and so far offshore, they're generally more protected than our shallower reefs because they're not as affected by coral bleaching or not as affected from, by land-based sources of pollution. But as climate change continues to advance, um, this may change the fate of our mesophotic reefs. So because they're in deeper waters and not used to those fluctuations in temperature or used to fluctuations in ocean acidification, they might be that much more susceptible to climate change. And so we're hoping not, but we might see a huge loss in mesophotic reefs. And what this means for the future of our fisheries is currently unknown because if we lose these deep coral reef habitats, we don't know if fish are gonna be able to continue to spawn the way they do. We don't know if we're gonna know where they're spawning, if they're gonna move. And then if they're moving, then this might change the replenishment of our fisheries. So climate change is a huge question. Um, it's scary <laughs> to think about, but it's super important. And I would love to start to look into those aspects as well. Wow, Danielle, you have a lot on your plate and I have all the confidence in, in you in the world. You um, have really done an eloquent job of explaining these really big issues. The last question I see um, here so far is um, steps that local citizens can take to suggest a protected area. So for example, Round Bay on St. John, um, is there a way that citizens, community members, um, folks can make recommendations to DPNR or find out what areas may be considered um, for protection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and being that I just started at DPNR, I haven't really been faced with this question yet. Um, but I think, you know, if there's a group of individuals that really want to get an area protected, you know, stakeholders are very important in management decisions. And so, you know, making these voices heard at fisheries meetings at um, the public meetings that we hold with the Caribbean Fisheries Management Council. Those are all very important um, because then that puts it on the forefront to be discussed by the Caribbean Fisheries Management Council and DPNR, um, especially if they're shallow reef areas. If they're deep reef areas, that's more, because those are federally protected waters. So that would be more of an issue with NOAA um, but my suggestion would be for stakeholders to come together and present these suggestions at the publicly held meetings so that they can start to be put into the meeting notes and start taking action towards hearing what our community wants. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any more questions. This is a recorded session. It'll be accessible on our website. Uh, we hope to hear lots more from Danielle. Um, she is obviously a, a woman of many accomplishments. She's also volunteered with the Learn to Swim program on St. Thomas. We hope she'll help us out um, with our education outreach here on St. John and 
and more broadly um, with classrooms all over the Virgin Islands. So thank you again, Danielle. Um, so grateful to have you this morning. Uh, without further ado, folks, um, stay tuned for more um, sessions this week. Tomorrow at noon, we have Dr. Marilyn Brandt. Um, and that is going to be an interesting segue from Danielle's talk talking about coral um, restoration and resiliency. So thank you again. Thank you, Danielle. Great... Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. Good job, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle.